I hope you're all recovering okay from the week. Uh, I know some of us are recovering from spring break. If you got a spring break, I uh, hope that you are recovering from spring break. If uh, you didn't, you know, I'm sorry about that. I'm sorry for your, your suffering and your, and your loss there. Some of you are still recovering from time change a week ago. How many of you are still recovering from time change? Oh man, those mornings feel really early right now, don't they? Others are recovering from their team's early exit out of the NCAA tournament. Right, Aggies? <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Never gets old. Never gets old. Anyways, sorry, just couldn't, I couldn't resist. Yeah, I know, there's always hissing and whooping and stuff. Uh, we are in the second to last week of our walk through this Old Testament book of Ecclesiastes. Um, Austin's gonna wrap the series up next week, looking at the second part of chapter 11 and chapter 12. Uh, last week, Sarah led us through chapter seven, and so we've got a little bit of a gap here, and I was really thinking through, praying through, um, I don't have time to cover chapter eight, nine, and 10, because none of you would stay here that long. And so I had to kind of narrow it down a little bit. And um, what I realized is chapters eight and nine um, are a little bit repetitive. Um, Solomon is saying some things that he had said previously. And, and again, it's not unimportant, and I would encourage you to, to read it. We have a reading plan that goes along with every book of the Bible that we study. But uh, it is a little bit repetitive, and so I wanted to kind of camp out today in chapter 10. Uh, Chapter 10 of Ecclesiastes actually reads more like Proverbs. Uh, Solomon also, in the middle of his life, wrote Proverbs. And of course, it is a book um, about wisdom and and kind of comparing and contrasting living a life of wisdom as opposed to living a life of foolishness or folly. And so chapter 10 of Ecclesiastes, you'll notice it's actually going to read a lot like uh, Proverbs. And of course, the same author. And, and ironically, you know, wisdom biblically defined is first and foremost about knowing God, knowing who God is, and then living your life in light of that truth. That's what Solomon himself is going to say in Proverbs, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge. And so Solomon declares this, that biblical wisdom is first and foremost about knowing God and then living life in light of that truth. And yet Solomon himself doesn't live like that much of his life. In fact, um, again, I want you to picture as he writes Ecclesiastes, Solomon is an old man. Uh, Think of an old man sitting in a rocking chair on his front porch, and he is looking back over his life and his his choices and his pursuits and everything that he's done. And and you'll notice as we've gone through Ecclesiastes that that Solomon is looking at everything and he he constantly is saying, it just feels meaningless. Man, it just feels meaningless. It feels like we're like hamsters on a treadmill. Man, we're working really hard and going nowhere. Meaningless, meaningless, meaningless. But I would say that Solomon at least comes to this conclusion. Looking back on his life, he's going to say that it's better to live a life with wisdom than a life with foolishness and folly. Better to live a life of wisdom. And so, as we walk through chapter 10, what I want to do is just kind of break it down into some sections and and really kind of pull out, he's going to use some language that we may not be real familiar with. He's going to talk about some things that are going to sound a bit foreign to us. But if I can pull out kind of the meaning um, and, and, and really some characteristics, if you will, of wise people. And hopefully as we walk through the scriptures, as we always do, we can evaluate our own life. Am I living a life walking in wisdom or am I living a life with a lot of foolishness and a lot of folly? And hopefully it will cause us to kind of um, really let the scriptures evaluate our lives and see where, where we stand, all right? And so Ecclesiastes chapter 10, beginning in verse one, here's what Solomon tells us. He says, dead flies make the perfumer's ointment give off a stench. So a little folly outweighs wisdom and honor. A wise man's heart inclines him to the right, but a fool's heart to the left. That is not a verse for all of you political conservatives, just so you know. I know some of you are like, you got that one posted somewhere, man. You're like, yes, my pastor said it. It's in the Bible, right? Um, This verse most most likely is about the reality, as Solomon writes, that most people in this world um, are right-handed and therefore more adept, more skilled, more steady with their right hand than with their left. And so the idea that you're more steady, more skilled, more uh, trained, if you will, being wise. Now, I'm left-handed, so I don't know what that says about me. Maybe the lefties among us can read it the opposite way. But uh, yeah, not a political verse, just throwing that out there for all of you here and all of you listening, you know, on the, on, the, on the live stream. Um, he goes on in verse three. Even when the fool walks on the road, he lacks sense, and he says to everyone that he is a fool. 
Fools kind of give themselves away pretty quick when you're talking with them, right? If the anger of the ruler rises against you, do not leave your place, for calmness will lay great offense to rest. So here's kind of the big idea that I wrote down in this first section, and that's this. That wise people pursue and maintain wisdom. Wise people pursue and then maintain wisdom. Here's the thing. When you get wisdom, it's not something that you just kind of get one time and then you're good for the rest of your life, okay? And Solomon is someone that can really, he he knows this to be true because again, we saw earlier that, that Solomon asks God for wisdom and God was pleased by his request and so God gives him a lot of wisdom but then his own life shows that Solomon didn't maintain that wisdom very well. Solomon actually chose to disregard the wisdom that he had and walk in a great deal of foolishness most of his life. And so wisdom is something that you don't just get one time and then you're good. It's something that we need to continually pursue and maintain. Wisdom needs to be maintained. And all of us, listen, the idea that, look, dead flies make a perfumer's ointment give off a stench. It it just takes a little bit of foolishness. One really foolish decision can ruin a marriage, can ruin a business, can ruin a ministry, can ruin a church, can ruin a life. Some of us have lived this and some of us have heard many stories about someone that was, man, they seem to have everything going for them, they seem to be making wise choices and then one foolish decision messes it all up. Something that God created to be so good and to be so beautiful can be messed up with a little bit of foolishness and a little bit of folly. And so wise people, they pursue and they maintain wisdom. Wisdom needs to be maintained. Let's jump down to verse eight. Here's what he says in the next section. He who digs a pit will fall into it and a serpent will bite him who breaks through a wall. He who quarries stones is hurt by them and he who splits logs is endangered by them. If the iron is blunt and one does not sharpen the edge, some versions say sharpen the ax, He must use more strength, but wisdom helps one to succeed. If the serpent bites before it's charmed, then there's no advantage to the charmer. Here's what Solomon's saying, that wise people have a plan and they execute the plan. They know what they're doing. They know the direction that they're going because they have a plan. Like what good does it do you to be able to, you know, be a ditch digger if you're just going to fall in the ditch? Or to quarry stones if you're just going to be injured by the stones? Or to charm a snake If you forget to charm the snake, now I know we probably don't have a lot of snake charmers in the audience today. If you are a snake charmer, I'd really like to talk to you because I'm not sure how that works. But but he's using some examples here and saying that, again, the fool has no idea what they're doing. The fool has no idea what they're doing. Wise people have a plan and they execute the plan. And here's the thing. For a lot of us, I think we have good intentions about being better in certain areas of our life, right? Uh, Some of us want to be a better spouse. I want to be a better husband. I want to be a better father. I want to be a better boss or a better employee. I want to be better. I want to be a better follower of Jesus. I want to be a better disciple. But a lot of times we can spend our lives wanting to be better at something and never actually put a plan together and execute the plan to actually get there, right? And so uh, what Solomon's saying is for some of us, it's not the desire that's wrong. We have desire to be better, to be better husband, better father, better, better whatever, better follower of Christ, but it's not enough just to want to be better. You need a plan and you need to execute the plan. Uh, in other words, some of us, we need to, we need to sharpen the ax, if you will. It, it's not about having a different desire. The desire is there, but we need to sharpen the ax in certain areas of our life so that we can execute the plan. We need to begin to put one foot in front of the other to get to the place we know God wants us to be rather than just spending our days wanting to be better. And Solomon says that wise people put the plan together and then they execute, they execute the plan. What areas of your life would you say you need to sharpen the ax a little bit? I need to put the plan together. I need to execute the plan. We'll jump down to verse 12. The next section here. He's gonna talk about the choices of words and, and, and who we listen to. Verse 12, the words of a wise man's mouth win him favor, but the lips of a fool consume him. The beginning of the words of his mouth is foolishness, and the end of his talk is evil madness. A fool multiplies words, though no man knows what is to be, and who can tell him what will be after him? 
Here's kind of the third big idea. It's not rocket science, but wise people listen to wise people. Wise people listen to wise people. Who do you seek advice and counsel from, right? If you want to be um, a better worker, a more diligent worker, a better employee, if you wanna learn how to run a business, then it's probably a good idea to talk to someone and get advice and counsel from someone that has done that. Someone that is a diligent worker, someone that has run a business before. If you want marriage advice, it's probably best not to go to someone that's been divorced five times, right? Hey, tell me how you do, like, like that's not the person you wanna go to. You know who you need to find if, for marriage advice? You need to find the older couple that's been married for 50, 60, 70 years, sitting in a rocking chairs, you know, still very much in love, and go, how do you do it, right? How did you do it? I want, take a, take a notepad and a pen and just take notes on, on how they got to where they are, right? That's what you do. You, you, you seek um, advice and counsel from wise people. Identify some wise people in your life. And, and man, those are the people to go to. Those are the people to listen to. Solomon's just given this word of warning here. Wise people tend to listen to wise people. Next, then he's gonna talk about work a little bit. And here's what he says. He says, the toil of a fool, verse 15, the toil of a fool wearies him, for he does not know the way to the city. And then he gives some practical example. Woe to you, O land, when your king is a child and your princes feast in the morning. But happy are you, O land, when your king's the son of nobility and your princes feast at the proper time. Proper time is key there. For strength and not for drunkenness, through sloth the roof sinks in and through indolence the house leaks. Bread is made for laughter and wine gladdens life and money answers everything. We'll come back to that last line in a minute. Here's the big idea. Wise people, they value both work and leisure. The key is the proper time. Wise people learn to balance and value both in the proper time. Solomon himself said back in chapter three, I would remind you, he says, there is a time and a season for everything under the sun. And so for some of us, listen, I'll talk to those that don't really like work first, right? For some, it's like you, you, you really can't stand work. You see work as uh, this thing you just wanna get away from as fast as possible. You wanna retire as quickly as possible. Um, you just, you don't, you don't enjoy work. You don't like work. You, you sort of treat work like it's a product of the fall, right? Genesis chapter three, all of a sudden, Adam and Eve sin against God and man, now we have to work all the days of our life, right? But that's not exactly how it happens. If you remember, God gave Adam and Eve good work to do in Genesis 1 and 2. Before the fall, before the fall, God puts them in the garden and gives them really good, meaningful work to do, and it is a good and a holy gift from God. Work is not an evil, wicked, or bad thing. Work is a good thing, and it's something that we should indeed do and see as a gift from the Lord. Now, maybe you're in a job you hate, and you're like, it doesn't feel like a gift from God right now, okay? Right? Right? We've all been there. We've all had seasons of our life where that may be true. But overall, he's saying um, wise people value work. They're not just constantly trying to always get out of work. At the same time, some of you maybe need to hear the other end of this. And that is that, that leisure and that rest and that fun is also good and holy and a gift from God, right? Right? That, that if you're the kind that, that overworks and is constantly bringing work home at the, and sacrificing relationships on the altar of work, that that's not wise either. That that's every bit as foolish as the lazy person who doesn't wanna work. And so Solomon's just saying, look, the wise people learn to balance and value both work and leisure. The key is in the proper time, in the proper context. Both can be really, really good. And so I don't know which end of that spectrum you fall on or you tend to fall on. I know that I've had to work really hard at balancing this in my own life. I, I, w I used to not be very good at this at all. And, and to be honest, I've kind of I've been on both ends of the spectrum a little bit in my life. And so I'm, I'm learning to find that balance. I'm still learning to find that balance, work and leisure. But Solomon's just saying, listen, wise people value, value both in the proper time and in the proper context. Then in verse 20, 
he says something else about wise people. He says, even in your thoughts do not curse the king, nor in your bedroom curse the rich, for a bird of the air will carry your voice or some winged creature tell the matter. This is simply a verse about um, gossip and slander. Wise people are careful with their words. Wise people are careful with their words. Wise people are not full of gossip and slander. Um, Even when they think no one is listening, they're very careful with what they say because you never actually know who is listening or the way that you may come across. I would say this is even particularly dangerous in a world with social media, right? Um, Any little thing you say, any little thing you post um, can often be used, taken out of context, and man, it never goes away, does it? It's like always there. Wise people are very careful with their words. Be very careful with what you say. Wise people are not full of gossip and they're not full of slander. Then we get to the part uh, about money. Verse, uh, chapter 11, verse one. Cast your bread upon the waters for you will find it after many days. Give a portion to seven or even to eight for you know not what disaster may happen on earth. The last line of verse 19 I read a minute ago, money answers everything. Now, some of you would hear that and go, that doesn't sound right. Like I've been told money is not the answer to everything. And there it is right there in the Bible in verse 19. Money answers everything. Seems a little bit confusing, right? Here's the big idea from Solomon is that wise people are good stewards. They're good stewards with their money, their possessions, their resources. You can extend that on to your time, your talents. Wise people tend to steward well what they have been given and blessed with. We say this a lot when we talk about money around here, that money itself is not evil, wicked, or bad. There is nothing in the Bible that declares money is evil, wicked, or bad. Some people misquote a verse. There is a verse that says, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, but that verse does not declare that money, riches, possessions, and wealth is evil, wicked, or bad. Everything we believe about money, riches, possessions, um, actually, again, if you're a follower of Jesus, it revolves around the truth that you and I see ourselves as stewards, not as owners, okay? And I've said this before talking about money. If I see myself as a steward, that, that God is the one who has graciously, out of his goodness, blessed me and given me some, then guess what? It is my joy then to be generous and to share a portion, a part of that, to bless some other people. Okay, I can be a steward. I am simply stewarding what God has blessed and given to me. But if I see myself as an owner, then it's, I'm entitled to it, right? It's mine. And when you see something is mine, you tend to hold on to it very, very tightly and you're always reluctant to, to let any of it go. And so as followers of Jesus, we don't see ourselves as owners of anything. We see ourselves as stewards of everything, okay? And Solomon's simply saying here that wise people are good stewards, Wise people steward the resources and possessions that God has given them very, very well. In fact, that line, uh, money's the answer to everything, what he's getting at here is that wise people will put money to good use and use money to solve problems. That's what wise people, foolish people spend all their money on themselves. All their money, all their possessions, all their resources terminate on themselves. Wise people will look to use some of their money to be a blessing and to solve problems and to help. And so we've said it this way before, we don't want to love money and use people. We want to use money to love people. And so wise people are good stewards and you'll notice that good stewards tend to be very generous. They tend to be very generous. And just a, a word there from Solomon about stewardship. And then finally, the last part of this, chapter 11, verses three to six. And this may be some of the hardest teaching uh, yet from Solomon. Here's what he says. If the clouds are full of rain, they empty themselves on the earth. And if a tree falls to the south or to the north in the place where the tree falls, there it will lie. He who observes the wind will not sow. He who regards the clouds will not reap. As you do not know the way the spirit comes to the bones in the womb of a woman with child, so you do not know the work of God who makes everything. In the morning, sow your seed. And at evening, withhold not your hand. For you do not know which will prosper, this or that, or whether both alike will be good. Here's the big idea, and then I'll unpack it just for a second. But wise people, they don't make excuses for a lack of obedience. Wise people don't make excuses for a lack 
of obedience. He gives several examples here in the text. He's saying, look, um, God will sort of tell someone to, to go into the forest. God will tell someone to go, you know, tend to the land or, or the crops, sow the seed. And what happens sometimes is someone will go, well, I know God has told me to do something. I know God has sort of moved in my heart to go do something. But man, if I go in the forest, a tree might fall because it's kind of windy and a tree might fall, so I better not. Like I know I should go kind of sow the seed and, and take care of the land, but you know, it's, it's a little bit cloudy out and it might possibly rain. So I, I better not, I better not. And so the fool sort of sits back when they know God has led them, God is leading them, God is calling them to do something. They sit back and they make a bunch of lame excuses for why they will not follow through with obedience. And they can sound really legitimate, but the text is gonna say, at the end of the day, we're called to obedience, right? We're called to obedience. In fact, um, he's not saying that, look, the tree might fall. The tree might fall. The wind might, might blow, the rain might come. Those things are going to happen in life but again, they're not to be excuses for not, not walking in obedience. I would remind you again, we're called to obedience, not results. The results are in God's hands. You and I are called to walk in obedience. And so this is true for us as individuals. It's true for us as a church. When you know God is leading you, calling you um, to do something, then basically we need to not sit around and think of all the reasons why we can't or shouldn't. We need to learn to put one foot in front of the other and walk in obedience and leave the results to God. That's what Solomon's saying. Don't waste your days, don't waste your breath, don't waste the heartbeats that you have left doing nothing while sitting around making excuses. In conclusion, here's what I wanna say as we wrap this up. It's always my hope and prayer as we read the scriptures that we can evaluate our own lives in light of what the text says. And so as we talk about wisdom and folly, maybe you're able to look at your own life and maybe see some areas where man, If I'm honest, there's a lot more foolishness and folly in certain areas than there is wisdom. And that's a good thing. Again, that's not something you should run from. That's something you should run to and welcome, right? And so here's what I would tell you though. The good news is this. If you examine your life and you examine yourself and you discover that, man, there are some areas with a lot more foolishness than wisdom in my life, the good news is that you don't have to stay that way. That God has provided grace to enable you to move from foolishness to wisdom. You might even remember in James chapter one, verse five, Jesus' half-brother, he was a pastor, and he writes at the end of the New Testament, he says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives graciously and generously to all. And so there's a declaration there in scripture that if you feel like, man, I'm not very wise and I need more wisdom, the first place is you, you go to God for that wisdom, you ask God for that wisdom, and that God's the one that will give you wisdom. And then I would tell you this, that we'll just kind of end where we started, that again, wisdom biblically is about knowing God. It's about knowing who God is and what God has done for you. Wisdom is about knowing Jesus, God's son who came to earth and lived and went to a cross and died on a cross in your place for your sin. Think about this. Christ died for all of your foolishness and all of mine. All of the sin and all of the folly and all the rebellion that we have, Christ went to a cross and he died for that sin so that we no longer have to walk in foolishness, but we can turn to him and place our faith in him and walk in wisdom. That's the message of the gospel. It's grace, we can't earn it, we don't deserve it. It is a good gift from our very good God. And so my heart and my prayer for us as a church and you as an individual is that we wouldn't walk in foolishness, that we would maintain wisdom and that starts by knowing God and trusting in Jesus. Let's pray together this morning. Father, we are grateful today for your word. God, we're grateful that sometimes it's just so very clear. And I know, God, if we're honest in here, I would imagine most of us, if not all of us, have some areas of our life where we'd probably have to admit there's a lot more foolishness or folly than there is wisdom. And so today, Father, we just ask for your help. We ask for your help, we ask for your grace in those areas. I pray that we would, that God, we would, we would sharpen the ax today. That we wouldn't just simply sit around wanting to be better, 
but that God, you would give us some very clear steps and some very clear direction for putting one foot in front of the other, other for, for having a plan and executing the plan to become the people that you want us to be, to become the followers of Jesus that you want us to be. And so we simply ask for you to help us in that. Father, today we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for his great sacrifice for us at the cross. We're thankful today that he died for all of our foolishness so that we don't have to walk in foolishness and live in foolishness, but we can turn and trust him and begin to walk in wisdom. So we pray for this today and we thank you for this today in Jesus' beautiful name, amen.